Oxford. Uh, all of us over in uh, who are presenters and have been presenters at 60 Mock are all volunteers. We don't do it on our work time, we, including me. All the research is done uh, on our own time and delivered as our own contribution to just, you know, helping share knowledge. We don't present ourselves as experts. We present ourselves in the 60 Mock community as people who are actually just interested in sharing and helping to increase knowledge. You know, that's basically our, um, our edict. Uh, MCBI continues to support it, which is great, which is why I've got the banner up here tomorrow. But I think most people know I work 50% over at MCBI and 50% um, in the jungle, which is becoming a little bit more evident now. Um, for probably Maria, I'll only, uh, I'll only just briefly explain, you're probably aware of this. Uh, we, have, we started a charity a number of years ago and we've been um, really, really lucky with the support that we've had with the charity, but also the impact we've been able to slowly generate around helping, you know, improve the messaging and the education around domestic violence. So we're coming in, I think it's our fourth, I don't know, one, we've been doing it for a while now, but we're, um, we're about to launch our new Hunt for Hero Awards for 2021. So, and we can't do it without the support and also the financial support of you know the 60 mockers who when we used to do face to face we might drop a couple of coins in well those coins now have turned into awards community awards uh, which means volunteers out in south australia who are doing great work receive a small chunk of money on december the 5th each year and also a big heartfelt thanks from all of us in the south australian community who really uh, benefit from a reduction in family violence so it's pretty topical at the moment and you guys who have been contributing to this over the years have um, also, you can feel really, really happy going into, you know, coming into the, um, you know, the weekend or maybe even, you know, yourself, give yourself a pat on the back just for, you know, helping be a part of that supply chain to try to help reduce those, um, that total impact. So, hey, Brian, how are you? Welcome. Good. We're Good morning. The, basically the ads. Now, I will let you know, Brian, we're actually recording this now because it will go up on YouTube, this recording. So uh, try to dial back any swearing or anything. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Just be aware of that. All right. All right. I probably shouldn't say it because that actual recording now is going to be up there. Um, we also just want to acknowledge that Mahali Coffee has continued to be a supporter of 60 Lock. And there's, I think, um, most people where there's if you uh, contact them we'll actually give you or you order online there's 20 percent discounts available to all of you and they contribute they actually give us financial offsets um, plus also coffee as well which is pretty cool so Mahali Coffee another South Australian company down at Rogue and a lot of people don't know they're actually an internationally award-winning company so they're like amazing and it's right in our backyard so all right Warning, warning, warning. This goes up on YouTube. Um, it, we're not, it's not, this one, this content is not as controversial, so you don't have to get too, um, you know, concerned. This is a more of a mainstream 60 Mock. But, you know, 60 Mock is supposed to be about elevated learning, not just sort of, you know, being basic. So if we do get into some areas around leadership or trusting remote workers, then let's all make a decision, a personal commitment to not be offended <laughs> and instead embrace divergent views. All right, recorded. So today's little meander um, is going to cover a few different elements around remote working. And originally when we put the spec together, it was based on a huge appetite from of people to say like, what's the best way to manage remote workers? And it's, a, um, it's been a really actually interesting research piece because there are, I think all of us can accept we're actually in a moment of flux at the moment and nobody, despite how authoritative people are talking at the moment, I don't think anyone can actually offer a magic formula of what is best in class around remote working. Uh, so today, what we're going to do is to show you the progression of where people are going in terms of remote working, some of the some of the best things to consider. But we will conclude with this idea of considerations. Like what are the things that you and your organisations are going to have to, that's my dog just yelling at a bird, sorry. But what are the things that you're going to have to really consider when you're, if you're looking at having a remote working um, program in your organisation? 
but also if you're just looking at trying to create your own remote working activity yourself. So it's sort of a bit multifaceted, this one. Now, we weren't going to, but we're also going to infuse through today's session a little bit about leadership. And it's not about leadership, like, you know, how to be like an amazing leader or anything. Its focus is primarily on the concept of trust around leadership. Because one of the things that is starting to emerge around remote working is the stress that it's applying to traditional leadership models. Because you actually can't see people and you can't make judgments and, you know, even performance reviews and all of those things are now getting knocked around. So we've added a little bit of that just to give a bit of texture as well. So yeah, just before I get into the guts of it, is there anything that you guys are like, you know, are really sort of burning? You're like, oh, yeah, I really want to know about this. And we offer it to the group because it might not be me that answers it. It might be someone else, you know, who's sitting here that says, oh, yeah, I know a bit about that. And we can help and collaborate with each other. Um, you don't have to, but if there's anything that you're really, really interested, please let me know sort of now, once you come off mute or put it in the chat, whichever suits. Anything that's burning, burning knowledge that you need or want to discuss? So my principle, I wait three seconds and then if there's no response, I'm like, okay, we'll just keep going because <laughs> it gets too awkward. So, Okay, we're good. All right. Well, if something does pop out, then just feel free to jump in, put it in the chat or what have you, just to, you know, just to sort of help, you know, each other and also get those unanswered questions that are inside you to get answered here today. You know, you're here, you've got an out, so you might as well like take advantage of it. All right, a little bit of history around what is remote working. Let's just start with a couple of basics. Now, if you Google what is remote working, you will have an absolute plethora of different definitions now. Some of them are very recent, post-COVID. Some of them are actually a little bit more historic, dare I say. And I elected to put in something in the middle. I thought, well, you know, remote working, it's become a... It's a real buzzword now. Everyone's like talking about it as though it's something new, but it actually is not new. And I think you'll be surprised to realize how old it actually is, um, remote working. But essentially, I'm going to use this one, this idea, you know, it's an old fashioned phrase of telecommuting. I, just, I love it. It just sounds like, I don't know, even that phrase sounds like it came out of, you know, when there were the old telephones on the wall and, you know, yellow pages are delivered to your doorstep. And Josh right now is going, what? What does that even mean? <laughs> but it's the idea that we use back in the old days, dare I say it, we use technology to be able to link people who are working in different spots to be able to continue to be productive and do their work, essentially. So, you, you know, the phrase telehealth we're reasonably familiar with, but the idea is that you don't have to go into this central spot and travel all together to be able to you know, get your work done. Now that has implications, like it's not just the people side, but in the old days, we would have filing cabinets and resources and customers would be coming to these central spots. So it made perfect sense. But obviously with the advent of the technology, it all those sort of concepts that promoted this idea of centralized workers all coming together, started to get a bit challenged. And so for the purpose of this, we're just going to use that really basic idea of we've got a central point here, which is all the working, you know, like the traditional head office. And then we've got these sort of satellite people moving in, you know, sort of working back to the mothership. But I'm pretty confident by the end of the today's session, you're going, not, that's not even like what we're talking about anymore. So let's go a little bit of history because this history is actually really interesting to where we are now. Now this here, just on the right, just for your interest, if you're interested in learning how to ice skate, you can actually do it on YouTube. There's actually a whole set of tutorials to teach you how to pivot and do jumps and what have you. And yes, I did get a little bit distracted and then realized that I have no hope of being able to do a jump in YouTube. So I gave up. Anyway, it's an interesting thing. If you've got kids or people, you can learn how to do it. Let's just talk a bit about, bit of, um, about working from home and some of the statistics around it. So I've called it pre-pivot. So the data I'm going to show you now is before COVID hit and we had this catalyst moment where we had to all go, oh, 
we would have to rethink the way we perform work. But I will show you some more recent figures as we sort of travel through this little journey together. So remote work, um, back before COVID, we were having like nearly, it was about nearly 20% globally, we're already working remotely. And they already have had technology and they already had um, different scenarios, you know, where people could sort of operate and connect with the mothership before, oops, sorry, click. Um, yeah, we already had all that in place before we, before COVID hit, and obviously that has escalated a lot. Interestingly though, that in um, the workforce in the United States has steadily been increasing around like what the remote, like the remote working environment has been getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And COVID, we saw this big J curve hit as well, where people were just starting to really adopt this as a traditional model. And around now, just before COVID, we had still a lot of companies who were, they were only hiring full-time remote workers, but a lot of companies before COVID actually were still saying, they were still reluctant to say remote workers is a legitimate part of our workforce. Now that's actually really similar to Australia. They're like, it's funny when you look at the Australian model of remote working, they're like, yeah, 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 we've got this sort of, this sort of proxy world of remote workers starting but they're not like the legitimate workers. We don't really have a structure in place yet that says this is actually a form of work. And all the different places around the world are at different levels of maturity, shall we say, like just coming up to that. But before we get all like, you know, because <laughs> I'm tired, was that a sneeze? <laughs> but before we sort of go like, <laughs> sorry, the, you know, what are these companies doing? You know, why aren't these companies are getting on board and offering this model to all their workers. I think by the end of this, you realise there's actually a lot to be considered if you're creating a legitimate workforce or a le legitimate part of your workforce as being re proper remote workers. There's more to it than just, you know, giving them a, a laptop and a login and a Zoom you know, account. There's more to it, which I think you'll, you'll, you'll just, you might be a little less critical of the companies that haven't quite got there. Now, I want to just quickly to show you this. Um, we're not going to do a big history lesson. We're going to get into what you need to do when you're looking at managing teams. But this might interest you because despite us feeling like remote working is a relatively new thing, I think if we look down here at these, like, if you look at the history of work as a concept, you might realise actually how rapid work, you know, the composition and what we consider in inverted commas work how rapid the changes have been over the last 100 years. Now, 100 years sounds like a lot, you know, in one way, but not really, because back here, so Ford, when on the, everyone on the factory line, you know, and everyone's like making, you know, the Model T Ford and all that stuff, that was only, that was only 95 years ago that that thing stood up. Sounds like a long time ago, but it's not really. But the rate of change has picked up, which then if we sort of scoot forward to 1979, where there were 26 workers in IBM back here, back in 1979, who were remote workers. And so IBM way back then was starting to trial this idea, do we need an office, do we need all of that stuff? And it's really interesting that it never really took hold. It was like, ah, oh, it's getting a bit, um, you know, it's a great idea, but we really can't get this thing to work. And there were all these like, problems, you know, that was sort of holding it. The cost of largest, though, kept all these big companies, particularly in America, persevering. And I think, I don't know if anyone was, I didn't, I wasn't aware that JC Penney was so progressive, you know, back here, which is a big company in America. But in the 80s, they actually distributed their call centers out to remote workers, essentially. Now, I think most people now know that Apple do the same thing, and they've been doing it. All their technicians are actually working from home. They're not in some contact center, like, some battery hand or what have you, it's in group that calls on those contact centres. They have been, they set their business model up right from the beginning with a distributed workforce and physically located differently. Now, that is different to a traditional organisation that has hubs of people and plus all the practices and behaviours and all that stuff that rely on the central focus. Like chat 
to each other, you know, over the petition type of thing. Um, all of that, an organisation around that will have a deeply embedded psyche and patterns and all that stuff that works around it. And then, but these other ones that went, no, 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 we're not actually going to follow that pathway. We're actually going to create a distributed model right from the very beginning. They're obviously incredibly well positioned now to look at, you know, to, to get a combat post COVID changes. And it is worth, if you are involved in any remote working consulting or remote working programs, to actually look at how those guys way back when, how they actually set their programs up and the foresight they had to actually sort of get this stuff um, over the line and actually build up legitimate workforces. I would probably give you a little word of caution about looking at some of the big companies that are trying to trans, you know, they're trying to nudge themselves over it because what you're actually seeing is a change effort in the middle of it and no one knows where it's going to land at the moment. So if anyone's telling you they've got it right, I don't know, question it. Be a little bit sceptical because it is um, it is a pretty full on. Now, this figure here, um, down here, 2030, this is fascinating. So this forecasting in, in, you know, pretty fast period of time that in some areas they're saying 75% of workers will have a permanent work from home or work from anywhere model as a part of their package. So that's like really quick, like in nine years time, 75%. Now that might, I mean, for us as knowledge workers, we're probably like, eh, you know, good, you know, we understand that, you know, that's, that makes sense to us. But I encourage you to think about other industries or other services, like, who are already, you know, starting to, um, yeah, around 2004, yeah, implement a remote call centre where a staff lived in the UK. And, yeah, exactly. It's, but some of the other non, what we'd probably call non-traditional, non-candidate type of workforces, um, they're all starting to go that way too. So we're going to see this real big, seismic shift in the way work is looked at, leadership is looked at, and how work is actually engaged with this mothership idea on it. Now, before you, anyone looks at this slide, this is a straight cut and paste from someone else's. I only wanted it because of the carpenter, like some of these, these ideas around industrial revolution. But if you are good around your, um, your organisational change and history, you know some of the dates here are incorrect. Like the internet was not born in the 90s. It was born in early 80s, 1980, between 1981 and 1983, depending on. So I was just anticipating someone going, that's a load of rubbish. Well, yeah, it is, but it's pretty. And it had something about carpenters, which seemed like a bit of fun to include. So, <laughs> um, whoops. All right, so I guess the message is, oh, there it is, 70%, sorry. Um, not 75, I got it wrong. So, I think the big message I want to pass to yourselves is that when you're looking at best in practice or best, you know, the best models and what have you, no one's really, no one can predict the future just yet. Not just yet. There are, we are beginning to see green shoots around what's expected, but it is still a forming a part of our whole working environment. All right. So it's a bit of flux. All right. Now, I just want a little bit about working with people in the remote world. Now, there's a whole body of work around how do you manage remote workers in the like in these sort of these different business models. Now, on one hand, like workers who are existing workers in the existing traditional models, where you know they have a central hub and they have to travel in, put on makeup, you know, wear the high heels, the daily commute, all of that stuff. Now, what is apparent is that when those workers, like that bunch, are given the opportunity to work remotely, the research coming out of Microsoft and Slack and, you know, those sort of people who are interested in it are saying people are happier. But I think it's really important for us to keep our head, like a level head around who is it that's saying that they're happier. So these are people who have now entered into a new business model and have been largely alleviated by some of their daily stress. So when you, you know, you read the reports, they're like, yeah, we, it was great. I don't have a daily commute. I can just 
you know, wear my leisure pants and I can still get my work done. Now that's great, but that's a new thing to them. And a lot of people talk about their quality of life has improved. They can run like washing, you know, they can get their daily chores done at home. Therefore, they have better, you know, family lives or whatever it is. There's just an overall improvement around their whole total quality of life, which has largely been enabled because of the advent of remote working. But there's, these stories of happiness are fantastic. You know, there's absolutely no denying them. But there's also another side to it, though, where we're seeing greater levels of uh, loneliness. We're seeing disconnection. We're seeing people feeling, I'll show you some of the, um, like some of the statistics. I don't know, my dog's just, I don't know if you guys can hear it, but my dog's just decided to start yelling like, like a fool that she is, right? <laughs> Sorry, I apologise for that. Well, I can't, I don't know, I probably throw something at it, but I'm not going. All right. The, um, what I was saying is that the other side of remote working though, and the people element is that they often feel a bit disconnected. All right, so what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna show you this, this little element around how we manage people. I'm gonna do my best to link the human sentiment of being in a remote working environment. You know, your company's gone great and seemingly everyone around you is going great. This is awesome. I get to, I don't know, go get the washing done at the same time or whatever it is. But why am I sort of feeling a bit weird? And what it could be is that when you are deploying your remote working model, you may not be looking at this idea of trust. So this is this leadership, this, this idea of how do you substitute a remote working model to still embrace this core requirement of great culture being a high trust environment. Now you can see on the screen here, like we, un we sometimes underestimate the value of trust, you know, like, Sometimes we do it in relationships, but in the work culture, trust should be a really, really important part of your culture and your target when, you know, in terms of how people feel. And you'll see things, these statistics are consistent over decades, like high trust environments or high trust companies, they just get better results everywhere, everywhere. Like, you know, and there's another set here, which you can look at around how they, they generate better profit, you know, they're, they're more resilient, they're more robust and that, because essentially whatever they've done in their culture and their structures um, allows people to feel safe, they feel trusted and therefore they are trustworthy on it. And it creates this sort of immune system where someone who maybe is not as trustworthy, they start to feel a bit uncomfortable and it sort of spits them out, which is great. Now, let's look at remote working though. Remote working, is showing up that the concept of cultural trust can get impacted unless you build a remote working model that actually prioritizes how do we keep the trust and how do we keep people feeling engaged on it. Now this is, you know, if you scoot on the internet, you'll see a whole lot of information about, you know, letting people feel like they're a part of things and, you know, like having changing your work day so you have check-ins and all of that stuff. And I guess if you're not in a creative mood, you could probably just use, you know, one of their models and then try to replicate it. However, what you're trying to do is when you're attempting to replicate someone else's little checklist, you're trying to get this outcome to at least keep the culture if you've got a positive culture in place. Now, remote workers from a people side are talking about yeah, it's great, advantage, tick, tick, love it. It's, you know, love it, it's great. However, we're starting to see some of the cracks that are emerging around human dynamics, you know, in the workplace. And this is, um, I've got to separate these two company types, like the JC Penney's who've got the distributed workforce since the 1980s, they wouldn't have this because they, they wouldn't know any different. They have grown and evolved to be able to combat some of these issues differently to say, I don't know, um, oh God, the mental blank, like a company, a government, actually a government would be a really good one. Where the really traditional model where you have a whole bunch of people, they meet face to face and then they, um, you know, they're sort of 
or collective, they sort of build up these businesses and practices that enable or result in people feeling included. So I'm going to do, because most of us are probably in that second group I've described and we're trying to transition. We're trying to transition to get something that looks like that. So trust. So 55% of remote workers um, when interviewed, this was a broad interview, uh, so research piece that was done by Slack, um, which is, you know, Slack, the software, I'm sure most of you know that, but they did a sort of one of these poll surveys across a group and a lot of people were saying they actually feel left out. They don't feel um, their companies have not been able to bridge the gap of letting people feel included in a new model. Now, see the little picture in the background? People feeling left out is, you know, it has a moment, you feel a bit sad and a bit like, oh, they didn't really, you know, whatever. But a lot of the psychology now around workplaces and collaboration is highlighting that exclusion of people has a bigger impact, negative impact, like just, you know, excluding people from central decision-making or collaborating or brainstorming or any, you know, empower, you know, stuff that you can help to influence it has a bigger impact on morale and engagement than possibly anything else. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? So if we just like don't, we're not interested in people, guess what? They also return the favour back to us and say, we're not interested either. We're not interested back. So when you're looking at how to build your new remote model, you have to prioritise how on earth do we get the feeling from people that they actually feel connected because they will tolerate some of the glumpy technology for a short period of time. But what it will do is that, that loyalty and that engagement will erode over time unless there are meaningful and creative ways to, to keep people to feel as though they're still included on it. The other part is this one down here, the third statistic, 39% are not able to access information and resources. And like a lot of technology is really struggling. I think we... The Australian IT community should take a huge bow of like just amazingness for the 2020 effort, how they mobilised and got everyone remote working. We had some videos, we had some sort of basic stuff that was sent out that kept us productive during the pandemic. But, you know, humans and business and what have you, the appetite to be able to actually replicate the work environment is building and it's building strongly. There's an impatience emerging saying, you know, this is great, we've got Zoom, but how do I actually run my whole, my whole workplace, my work, you know, what I need to do to do my job? How do I do that remotely? Or are you going to actually try to force me back into an office? Because now I've actually been anti that as well because you can't deliver a business model or a, a structure or system that allows me to be able to do my job properly. This has big implications when you're doing a design, right, for your remote workers. The two big implications are you act, your systems may not be able to stretch up to be able to give the experience to workers to work relatively seamlessly between whether they're in that central hub or if they're in their own workspace. Your system just might not be able to do it. I've got a client who's still working with like Citrix and I'm probably some people here are going, eh, what's up, we? Oh. But it's just what it's highlighting is how some of these um, organisations have been so underinvested in their IT that they've just like, they've, they've actually really surfaced up how actually how non-progressive they are on it. And their strategies are going to have to change over the next few years to be able to provide better IT solutions for their staff on it. Because the implications are bigger now. It's not just like a grizzle. People won't work there if they feel like they have to go to the central hub and maybe their heart is, you know, um, you know, they want to have these sort of hybrid arrangements. We've already seen everyone sort of going that way. But there's another, there is another implication that most of us in business analysis know if you continue to deliver really, really bad processes and systems but then apply pressure to workers to get stuff done. Oh, no. oh was it? Uh, did you find the Did you find the envelope? <laughs> plastic envelope? Uh -huh. It was on your desk. Oh, but I needed the. <laughs> I think that was Maria was talking to someone. <laughs> All right. So the, there is another implication that is serious to consider um, around if 
you have rubbish systems? Does anyone have a guess or if you're in a position to have a guess? You deliver a bad system to staff. What often happens? I'm going to do the three second rule. <laughs> I love the three second rule. Yeah, confusion. Yeah, you get a loss of productivity because no one really knows what the heck they're doing. They get all that stuff. You get workarounds starting to emerge. And in business analysis and business excellence and efficiency, these are little red flags popping in. But there's another really big one now because uh, it's a new world and it's the idea of cybersecurity. So when people start breaking, like breaking rules around and you know, they create bad habits. Yeah, lots of bad, bad, bad habits. Um, but you also may get security breaches or governance breaches as well. So really critical documents that should be like kept within high-end systems that were built over in that traditional hub model are now being emailed to each other. Or worse still, I saw a client saying their email doesn't work, so they just send it via their Gmail. Now we all are going, ah, freaking out over it. But imagine how difficult the decision is for a worker who is remote and they, they have a time, they're like, they've got a time bound or an importance issue and they're trying to get their stuff done, but the tools are unable to support a remote working arrangement. They just can't do it. So, and you can imagine that some of them with their focus is on trying to get the job done, which is what we're all about these days, like get the job done, may make, bad decisions to be able to get their work done because the remote working model has yet to be deployed properly. These are really big themes that are popping out. IT architecture is going to get slammed, like really slammed because we've got these two forces now at play where we have to have robust like remote working models and we also have to make sure our staff are serving being like adequately served to be able to get their job done to keep productivity up. And I'm not sure about you, I don't reckon the magnitude of this seismic change in IT has fully hit some people. I think they're just like, oh yeah, you know, it'll be fine and what have you, but there's not, there's, there's so much more that's gonna be coming over the, you know, the next few years. So the technology and impact is, um, is sort of sort of covered a lot of that stuff, but, there's this other thing that around workers that's starting to pop out, something that we personally experienced at our company, was when we have new people joining, the, the sense of inclusion that's so critical to keep people focused and what have you, um, is actually diminished a bit. Because you actually don't get to see each other and build, you know, relationships. You don't get to see my behaviours and body language. You, you lose the opportunity for the incidental conversations that mesh teams together, unless you create a substitute offering, basically. Uh, and I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time, but I will tell you, I had this, I went down this rabbit hole yesterday researching this. And I, <laughs> this is weird. Like, this is really weird what I'm going to tell you, but it's sort of cool. <laughs> so apparently, apparently, um, Apparently, this is so weird. Apparently, when we're happy, we release a hormone, which is oxytocin. So if you're just in a good mood, you're like, do, 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 we're all good. And oxytocin is gives us resiliency and you know, all that good stuff. It does lots of good stuff for us. But it actually smells. <laughs> this is where it gets weird really quick, right? So apparently, when we're happy, we actually give off a different pheromone and people can pick whether we are happy or not because on some sort of subconscious or really subtle level, we can pick up that they smell happy. <laughs> they smell happy, <laughs> so, which is weird. And the converse is true. An absence or a, a high level of cortisol um, smells different. So definitely Google that if you want some weird and research to go experience. Now, the reason I tell you that is the loss of the olfactory or the smell system in remote workers, even with each other, may be a bit more profound than we gave it credence for. I know that sounds strange, and I'm probably still not totally resolved around 
what that means for all of us. But apparently what it does suggest is that the connectivity of having a bunch of people working on a project together is way more than the stuff that's on the screen. We're picking each other's, you know, moods up, our inflections, our language, all of that, and also our smell, which is weird. But we're doing that, um, and that's how we actually create safety as well. Because apparently if someone doesn't, like when you, if someone um, smells differently, we make a judgment that they're safe. So if they smell happy, we're like, yeah, they're a good person. And I think I'll move on from that because I don't know why it weirds me out, but it weirds me out just a little bit. But it's so interesting around the advent of the remote worker. Now, the, now as we go into the, this is, gets a bit practical pretty quickly now. There is this other area in the workplace, and I'm sure many of you, if you're in leadership or you know, you've been in this world, you may have been considering is, what is the new duty of care look like? All of us in authority or who have, you know, people that we're responsible for are inherently uh, a plot. We inherently pick up this idea of duty of care. So duty of care extends all the way to the board. It's a legal requirement all the way to the top, right down to checking on each other with the, you know, the, that amazing program of are you OK? The remote worker model has yet to be resolved. We don't know what how this is all going to look. So if you trip if you trip up at work and you fall over because there was you know some poor poor safety item, the um, the the pendulum is always over on the worker so the workplace, and the workplace is found to hold the primary duty of care of not having you know creating a safe environment. And then there's all these systems and practices that are built up over the years. You know you get ergonomic tests. You know make sure the seats are okay. Mm -hmm make sure you've got screen, all of that stuff. But what we essentially do is outsourcing some of that authority or the vision around or creating an almost familial structure of duty care back over to the company. Now, the remote worker model, your organisations are going to have to resolve how do you unpack mutual duty of care? Mutual duty of care. That is a massive minefield. So... If someone, you know, there were these sort of odd stories that you hear pop up now and then someone fell over when they were at work, they're working from home, they fell over in their house and they were able to use the insurance system of the workplace to be able to then claim, you know, a, um, you know, you know, benefits and what have you over it. Now, applying common sense to that, that doesn't make any sense. Like it doesn't make any sense because the workplace doesn't exert any control over your, your house but they're still being held accountable and responsible for that, you know, for that misdemeanor, if I could call it. So it's, this is the flux that we find ourselves in, old fashioned insurance models and new models coming in, and they're sort of just grinding up against each other. But I'm pretty sure um, insurances will go up unless people start to resolve, you know, how this stuff works. Because imagine if you're the insurance provider and you've got this, all these different people living in all these different houses, and you're going to have to be the person backing a large organisation's, you know, duty of care or, you know, their staff uh, compensation models. It's so strange. I know we do work for Return to Work. Uh, they're actually going through some of this as well. Like, how does this, how is this all going to play out? Which then brings me to a little buzzword, which I've decided we're going to change and we're going to use one of these topics, this topic for later on at 60 Mock. And it is this incredible movement going on. It's one of my favourite things I have seen in literally decades, literally decades. And it's come from the Black Swan movement. Um, so picking up the duty of care, it says, yeah, yeah, that's all, that's all great. The idea of the duty of care is that we will evolve into more uh, organisations to have a more a stronger mutuality between employer and employee. And what we will be looking for as employers are employees who bring within the idea of anti-fragile. Now, anti-fragile is, as I just mentioned, is a part of the Black Swan movement, which if you want to Google that is really interesting. But what it says in its like core is that we're not going to have little passive employees now who are just like, ah, oh, you know, the pen's not in the right shape and I'm so, you know, fragile, it makes me upset. We're actually going to start to bypass some of those, that sort of environment and say, how are we building 
organizations and workforces that are anti-fragile. And by anti-fragile, it's not like you're all stoic and all, you know, you don't talk about your feelings or what have you. What it is, is this more mature level of resiliency and being robust. So when bad things happen or things don't quite go to plan or what have you, we don't see people throwing in the towel, becoming toxic, whinging or anything like that. What it's actually saying is that anti-fragile um, is we reject the idea that we are so princessy or fra princessy. Oh my God, I take that word back. That's not how I speak. But the idea of um, the, the <laughs> that we are strong enough as individuals and inherently able to overcome shocks and what have you to be able to keep moving forward. This is deeply connected to remote workers because if you do get into anti-fragility as, you know, as a business movement, it also looks about the full package of what you're going to be, what people are going to be looking for around employees. So rather than people who just bring skills, you know, if you're at home and you know, you're remote working and you're going to be encouraged to work autonomously, are you going to be able to do that without needing to be checked up on all the time or playing cat and mouse, you know, or, you know, all that stuff. Do you inherently have this idea of um, professional robustness and, yeah, you know, in all of those, those different elements to it? It is a fascinating part that is definitely been getting some, um, getting a bit of like airplay as a result of COVID, really. All right. And I should hasten to add, anti-fragility is not a diminished responsibility by the employer saying, I actually don't want to, I don't really care about your, you know, how you're feeling or anything. It's not that. It's a really different partnership model. So that, you know, a lot of these places that have embraced anti-fragility have great well-being programs, but they're also quite discerning around people when people are just maybe not a great fit for high dynamic businesses. Does that make, um, I feel like I haven't quite nailed in my heart how I think that should, these guys should be described, but all I'm gonna say is just Google it. It's a really interesting part. If your organization, when you look at your workforce is far from anti-fragile, building a new remote workforce plan could be very, very challenging, like, because it, there might be other problems, you know, that, like duty care and stuff. Types of work that is that are candidates for um, the remote workers. So this is no, this is not a mistake. This is Google. All right. So there are different types of work that lend themselves to being good remote working type of bunches of work. If your organization is a hub, like a hub model, then you've got to find work that has really clear outcomes. It has really, really nice, oops, sorry, has really nice um, like structures around it and that you can give to someone and they can feel confident to be able to work autonomously without constant checking on it. Now, this is, it's not every part, just, this is just one of many, but if you've got like a project or you've got a deliverable or something where someone has to work and they know what they have to do and, you know, has nice clarity, that's a great candidate for, you know, for, um, for remote working. If your technology is strong enough where it can actually mimic like a contact center, it's great. If your technology has evolved enough where it can support like some of the more, um, uh, some of the more like collaborative work, you know, you can with a bit of adjustment, get people to be able to pick up that other work. But there's probably, if you're looking at your remote work models, it's probably worth having a discussion with your team to go, what is not a candidate? What is, what work cannot? effectively now, like not yet, be evolved or pushed out to a remote model. And there are some, there are some that just don't really lend themselves to it. Junior work, people who need constant monitoring. Maybe you've got a team that just, it's, um, they're doing really transactional stuff, but they're like in a, you know, they're, they're in a little chain and they need to do things um, like processing alone is one that would have some challenges, it's not impossible, but it would just be a bit more challenged than other work. But maybe for yourselves, I don't know if there's anything that you think, oh, that's just not gonna work, you know, if we put it out into the remote world. Can you guys think of anything? Like... <laughs> that's okay, that's all right. You can Google some of this stuff as well. Now, Google 
have interestingly, as a result of COVID and where they were already creeping towards around distributed workforces um, and probably following Apple said, you know what, we're gonna have a permanent work from, uh, work from home or work remotely model. They were incredibly well equipped to be able to do that. Technology has been great, security has been great. Policies were already half done and they were able to uh, pilot it. They put it as a pilot first let everyone scramble around the transformation to be able to offer this whole new model. And then, you know, away they went on it, which is really interesting because people will want to work at Google. If you're someone who likes this stuff, they'll be like, yeah. And you'll end up with a, a competitive advantage for the employee. So just go that way rather than have like some old fashioned model that you have to go into. Now, these, um, there are real advantages of having a remote workforce, like a chunk of your workforce as you're just remote it. A lot of the workforces are more productive, but I will hasten to add that mm -hmm. for every article or every bit of research, they say, oh yeah, everyone's more productive. They're actually pushing out more work because there's less context problems or switches, there's less interruptions and that. So they actually just look more productive. <laughs> for everyone you read of that, then you read another one that says, no, 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 they're not getting stuff done. Now, if you're looking at a program and you're trying to shape it, I think you're just going to have to set aside some time to research and come up with your own views on how it fits your organisation. There's no one size fits all. But it is worth looking at, you know, do our, are our teams able to work autonomously in the work? You know, are they, are they, are, do we have high trust, high autonomy already? Then, you know, we're only going to overcome, overcome the technology barrier and then we can have a really cool remote working model on it. If you've got people who are already challenged or don't have a really strong connection with their organisation or they're just goofing off and that, that's only going to get worse when you can't see them on it. But there's no stock standard generalisation here. It's incredibly dependent on what the culture and the core part of your organisation is already on it. So up here, are, I think we've just done those. Knowledge workers are really good. Apple, I love the fact Apple just went out right from the beginning and just said, yeah, this is how we're going to run, you know, run our, our, our technical area. I don't know if everyone's aware of that. All the techos, when you ring them up, they're all working from home, which is pretty cool. But all of those big companies, you notice there's a bit of a theme here. A lot of them are technology companies who are very comfortable and very familiar with being able to liberate ideas and businesses with use of clever technology. So I can't imagine Apple would have some like old, you know, green screen somewhere. I mean, they've probably got it somewhere, but you know, they're not gonna, they're not gonna do that. It's not consistent with their who they are on it. But they also do, if you have been involved with Apple, you would know they have great digital tools and systems for staff. There are problems, yes, nothing's ever 100 percent perfect, but they also have great processes that generate this clarity on requirements and the work itself is very clear, which is if you've got an organisation that's, you know, sort of eroded a bit, it's got a bit frayed around the edges and people are doing stuff, you know, making stuff up, they're going to, you'll have trouble. You will have trouble. Now, the third one, though, is that all of those organisations have unified training. And what that does, it promotes the idea of clarity. So a lot of people have bigger induction programs now. And what you're seeing is the, a lot more e-learning saying this is how you do stuff. And what they're trying to do is get rid of that rework we talked about at the beginning. They're going, they're clever. They're like, get rid of that. And they're creating consistency in their workforce. So then they can monitor it better as well. You don't want a whole lot of people just making things up and you're spending all your time trying to figure out what the heck are they up to on it. Um, and I think those organisations that are serious about building great community and great businesses will also have to deal with some of this feedback now. Because what's looking is this really weird thing that workers are coming out with is that a lot of the remote workers are actually getting paid more. It's only a segment. All the knowledge workers are getting paid and it's a relative thing. Like it's, um, and this is in flux too, by the way, like, cause when you dig into the data, I found myself wanting to challenge it. I was like, yeah, but what does that really mean? It's, be patient for the next few years until this stuff sort of gets a bit more um, uh, settled, I think is the best way to put it. But what they're saying is that if we get a remote worker and, you know, they're doing a similar job as one that's in like a, um, in the hub model, the remote mm -hmm. workers seemingly are getting paid more. And that's to probably to cover 
you know, internet access, you know, the, the use of a house, all those, all those different areas. I don't know if anyone recalls last year, one of the unions jumped up and said, every organisation should be paying a levy to, you know, all staff, because you're now, you know, you're basically renting out your, your office back to the, the business. But that is like an old fashioned model. And I think they got dropped pretty quickly, because it's like, well, no, because if you make it too hard, we'll just make you go back in. Because financially, it doesn't make any sense for us to be like no business would be um, absorbing like little bits of rent, shall we say, everywhere as some type of model. They just wouldn't, yeah, you know, just wouldn't do it. So, yeah. Well, the ongoing cost maybe. I think there are there's lots of. Um, so Amory just sent a message to me saying, yeah, will the ongoing cost be less? It's a maybe. It's a real maybe um, because if you have, you know, a thousand workers and you're, you know, you then try to translate that rental model, it actually could cost you more. If you're only looking at it as an individual, yeah, but it doesn't work like that. It's, um, it's a maybe. Now, I just wanted to just, so I'm going to click through because this is the, we get a bit practical here, a bit more practical. Some of the questions that are coming out straight away, who's going to pay for the internet? How are your laptops, your security, all of those things? I know in our firm, it was like shopping day at, and said, look, pick up screens, pick up keyboards, whatever it is, pick up, go and try to make it look as much like the office as you possibly can. Um, one of the items that has emerged is around like furniture and ergonomics. I, I haven't got it here, but um, I've actually got a little, I call it my granny seat. And it helps my back and, you know, that type of keeping everything straight when I'm working. But there is a whole policy, a whole area of oh and now starting to pop up saying, if you've got people sitting in front of a screen, then back in that hub model, you'd actually have to make sure they had the right seats. Isn't that true for like the future as well? Or are we going to abandon that and that duty of care is going to get separated differently? And that will, what we'll do is then go here, it's up to you to get the right seat. Here's an allowance. But I reckon the lawyers are going to have an absolute, they are mm -hmm. going to have such an interesting process navigating all this stuff. And then I like this last one, this last comment, which is quite controversial. If some of the remote work, if, and if some of the remote work expenses are covered, do the remote employees take a pay cut? There was this whole thread I watched, all these people debating, saying, would you actually take a pay cut to work remotely? And based on the chat, you know, highly scientific analysis is that most people are saying, yeah, if I could have a great working from anywhere or great working from home experience, I would take less pay to be able to have a be that better lifestyle. And this sentiment is so prevalent in like millennials and under. The you know, because essentially a lot of those millennials and under have been born into prosperity. They don't have the same like quarter mentality as X gens and above do. They don't, they've never saw a recession. They don't, they don't have that in them. So they're like, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm going to go like travel in a combi van. And I'm going to like be the digital, like, you know, the digital person while I'm like cruising around looking at the world. I'm doing that too, by the way. Like I'm not criticising. I'm like, yeah, I'm with it. But it is a lot, there are a lot of things to consider if you're looking at providing this as a legitimate, as a legitimate model for your remote workers. So here, I just, this is some really big considerations, right? And I wanted to put the definition, I sort of did this as a bit of a joke, but I was like, well, not joke, I was like, yeah. I, um, I wanted, I put in the definition of what unresolved was, because I thought that's a weird word, because I keep talking about this unresolved, unresolved. So I'm going to start with that. What is unresolved? Unresolved is a problem or difficulty, it's unresolved, and there's no satisfactory solution yet. Like, yeah, I'm going to say yeah, because I'm positive, right? Yeah. And I'm sure Josh's eyes have gone to the fact the murder remains unresolved. <laughs> Sorry, I'm just obsessed with true crime. So, but the problem, it's unresolved and it has a feeling of dissatisfaction. So if you're involved in evolve, creating a remote working model, you like give yourself patience. This could take two or three years for us to get through all the different bits to, until we get to the point where we have a legitimate working from anywhere or a working from home model that organizations can actually clip on their existing hub model and company policy is a big one there is a little thread that's starting to emerge that only high performance like 
if you've got a bad performance review or you're not really in that, you're not doing the right type of work, you won't be able, you won't be offered remote work. To me, when I was reading it, it felt like, you know, you're in detention or you're in a special class. So you're like inferior. So there's this class thing that they're saying, and you can imagine the HR people going, I don't know, what do we do? We can't have everyone doing it. How are we going to manage it? And they've made some, one group made some decisions on that. I thought, oh, let's see how that one plays out over time. The other one is the expectation of remote working. Um, we've, uh, most people, millennials and under, expect it now. And if you don't offer it, you get that people won't want to work there. They'll be like, what? I've got to go through a daily commute, pay for it, make up high heels, blah, blah, blah. And what, you're not going to offer it? There is a hybrid thing that's starting to like to pop out as a straightforward area, but it's still unresolved. No one feels 100% satisfied they've got it right yet. Now, the last three are actually pretty big. Performance management. If you can't see someone doing work and you have relied on seeing them as, you know, as a leader, how are you going to substitute that? You can't be all micromanaging. You're not allowed to put cameras on, you know, just on staff, just because, you know, it's sort of interesting. And then last ones are these travel and duty of care. If you have a work from anywhere, a strategy like we have, there is a big question mark around when are you covered around travel and when you're not. And that's still unresolved as, as well. Now, the last thing I'm just going to like leave you with is this idea in remote workers is the shift of leadership. Um, I probably don't really get into the whole leadership thing too much because I think it's a really personal thing. But this, so this is an old fashioned model, but I think it's really interesting when you're looking at how you're going to build up non-fragile employees with this amazing technology and all this other stuff sorted. Leadership in its core is someone who provides direction, protection, and you create some type of order for everyone, you know, whether it's like managing work, you know, company policy, blah, 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 blah and all that stuff. You are the custodian of keeping things normal, basically, whatever that normal is. But one of the things that we forget is, sorry, one of the things we forget with leadership is that the people who are following you, they need to, they need to respect you, but they also assign a certain amount of energy to you to, for you to be able to offer direction, protection and order type of thing. They're like, yep, okay, we're going to follow you. And there's a whole, you know, whole raft of reasons around all that stuff. But when you have a remote workers, and it's maybe that connection is not as strong because you can't, I've got to say it, because you can't smell each other. <laughs> That's so weird. <laughs> it's such a weird concept. But anyway, um, but when you don't have those bonds, some of these other ideas of trust and those other elements are going to get stressed out as well. And you've got to find substitute ways. So, you know, a lot of people, when you look at them, are doing like they have regular fun catch-ups. They do you know, more face-to-face fun activities so you can actually mesh and build up stories together rather than just have you know the day-to-day work stuff uh, you, you might have um, more formal uh, uh, training so then everyone's unified you make sure everyone's they start at the same time so there's a connection all of those things to try to build up those other connections that in some ways we took for granted in the, the hub model on it because this leadership thing we still need we just need people who still offer direction and protection uh, for the workforce. So it is now one minute past. We have a big commitment, 60 months. I apologise for that. I did want to leave you with this little book. If you're looking for a short book that will blow your flipping mind, this book will blow it. It was written in 1913, I think, or 1908. It's a short book by the guy. But it's actually a lady, Ian Forster. She wrote under pseudonym. But this book, this person must have been able to predict the future. There's no way. Like, there's no way they couldn't have. But they actually talk about remote working in it and how the whole world is all about remote working. And if you're into historic books, get this book and read it if you want to see what the future looks like. Um, I don't know how she did it, but it is mind-blowing. Uh, turn of the century. So 19. It was written 19. So over 100 years ago, this book was written. Anyway, there's my tip. All right, summary. This is, oops, sorry. <laughs> i just flick around. Um, there is so much to consider with remote working. There is so many different elements that to be able to bring into it, but make no mistake, it's happening. And it has a seismic shift in the way that we offer uh, benefits and support and community to our staff. 
and organisations are in flux. It's sceptical if someone says they've got it all nailed out. It actually would be impossible at the moment. But the key is to understand technology, policy, and how the people are going to be reacting in your current model on it and come up with a plan that suits your organisation, not just one you're going to import from somewhere else and hope it works. It, the risk is too great. With that, I'm going to finish up and say thank you so much. The next session for 60 Mock is called Transactional. It's all about understanding um, what, what are the main benefits of remote working? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, there's a lot of staff. I'll just quickly answer that. On the hand, I'll just do this. The next session is on transactional analysis. We This topic of transactional analysis around psychology and what it does to workplaces comes up and has for so many years in all our training. So we've decided to dedicate it to a session. Please encourage some people to come along. It will make so much sense to you around how people act in workplaces. And you'll be able to go, oh, I see that. And you'll probably learn a lot about yourself as well. That's the next 60 months. So those of you who have to leave, thank you for joining us. For Anne-Marie, uh, the main benefits of remote working. Most of the benefits are towards the, well, how do I describe this? There's a lot of benefits for the employee. The employee. For the employer, there's not, you will end up with happier staff, I think, and you will get, you will end up being so far behind the main if you don't actually get your act together and start building some of this stuff up. It's, um, you look back at the history of it, it's been 30 years, 40 years since we actually started experimenting with remote working, but the benefits were not strong enough for the employers to be able to push it along. COVID and technology and people have started to force people to get their act together, you know, start to really look at it as a legitimate business model. There are, I mean, organisations like ours that are very much a part of an adaptive sort of ecosystem. It's great for us. You know, we don't, we have a remote working, which means that we can invest into other parts of the business and also other ways with people. But I'm, I'm probably struggling to think of for an employer point of view, the main is has been actually being on market to make sure you get the best staff available. Because everything else is a complication. And it is actually a seismic change. It's, it is, if you do it properly, it is seismic. But I think what a lot of places are, I don't think the pennies dropped for lots of places. So they're just gonna be running with an inherent risk for the next few years, having not really thought a lot of this stuff out or having a program to evolve it. I, I don't know if I answered that very well, but I, hopefully. Okay, yeah, it is pretty much like that's, it's gonna happen, it is happening. Any other comments? Nice to see you, Mark. Sorry, couldn't ride your bike here. <laughs> how, how do you donate to the... Um, I'll send it in the link. Um, I'll send a link. Oh, actually, that's very good of you. Oh, you don't have to. But it's a... Um, we're doing it um, with, the, with the foundation too. Um, we've started... We're commissioning some research on narcissism in the workplace uh, with Adelaide Uni and UniSA, which will be our first piece of research contributing to everyone. So, which is pretty exciting. I'll, I'll have to, I'll send it to you rather than try to scoot it around. But yeah, any, any, and it's, uh, you get a tax donation, you get a receipt, and you can use it on your tax as well. So, which is really great. And the board, we're not benefiting. <laughs> We just help facilitate it. <laughs> Any other comments, questions? I apologise for going over. I actually I didn't think I'd go over. But... All right. Well, if there's nothing else, one, two, three. Thank you so much for joining us um, on this, I think, a really important topic. And I think a topic that is just going to become really, really topical over the next couple of years. So have a great Friday, everyone. May Port win. Sorry for the Korea supporters, but I reckon we've got a reasonable chance this weekend. So uh, have a good one. <laughs> I knew someone would, someone would respond like, yeah. All right, great to see you, Mark. And um, you can see this all up online. We'll have it up online by the end of today. Okay, have a great Friday, everyone. Bye.